NFL Week 13 is over. It's time for your BLV reaction, review, and recap of this week in the NFL. What's going on? BLV football fans, it's Mitch here, back with another week of the bottom line, where I give you my thoughts, my analysis, and my unfiltered opinions on what I saw across the NFL this week 13 of the 2023 NFL season. And you tune into this show because I'm the best review on the internet. I'm the best on this microphone. I'm even the best on commentary. Shout out to anybody that got that reference. Grok spike the like button and subscribe. If you haven't already, it's Mitch the BLV. Let's talk some NFL. And as always, let me know in the comment section below your thoughts and opinions on week 13. Let's begin, as always, with Monday Night Football. And boy, do I kind of wish I was live for this game. Maybe it would have unfolded differently if I was live. I simply thought this game would be boring. I'm not going to lie. And I even had a deeper opportunity to sit back, relax, and watch the game and take some notes because I wasn't live providing the greatest commentary on the net. But it gave me a different perspective on Monday Night Football. So I was able to hear the commentary. I was able to sit and react to the game as it was unfolding. Be on Twitter. You know, be in the Discord. See how people are watching this game, and even giving some of my opinions throughout on Twitter. And if you're not following me on Twitter, I recommend you do. Not a lot of people do follow me on Twitter. I think I have under a thousand followers on the platform. But I typically do express a couple opinions each and every day on the NFL just to get them out there, just to give opinions, like just to have an idea that sparks in my mind and put it out there. I don't care who likes it, who retweets it. It's just the opinions. So if you don't follow me on Twitter slash X, then make sure you do that. Okay. The link should be in the description and I'll make sure that it's there. So we have the Cincinnati Bengals and the Jacksonville Jags. And before the game, I listed on the top of my notes, Jacksonville should easily win this game. That is the expectation. That is a big reason I didn't go live for the game. Now, some wackiness unfolded. Jacksonville, in fact, lost the game. Cincinnati won the game in overtime. And Jake Browning, yes, JB, not Joe Burrow of Cincinnati, JB, Jake Browning, had an epic game. For Cincinnati at quarterback. Jamar Chase showing up as the elite weapon that he is. Joe Mixon as one of the best running backs we've seen over the last five years. Half decade in the NFL. Showing up big time. Tyler Boyd throwing the ball to the other team. Which was one of the dumbest plays I've ever seen in my life. And the second note I put on my notes was let's see really how good Cincinnati's coaching is. And this season, why I thought this game would be so easy for Jacksonville is their defense has played well this year. They've overall been a pretty good defense. They've been a top 10 defense. They've had a top 10 run defense. And I felt like their pass rush had been performing at a pretty high level. They played really well against Houston last week. Now, maybe at home, they felt like 10-point favorites, there was no chance for Cincinnati, and they were caught off guard with a team that came out with energy and a good game plan offensively, especially. Cincinnati's defense had not been playing well. In fact, they were one of the worst defenses in all of football. And again, Cincinnati's defense didn't play that well. 
It was actually Cincinnati's offense that won them this game. So Cincinnati, what do they do? They come out running the football a little bit. Joe Mixon, Joe Mixon, Joe Mixon. They get the ball out quick. A lot of quick screens. A little smoke screens to Jamar Chase. Get the ball in Jamar Chase's hands. Just as many different ways as possible. Get the ball into Joe Mixon's hands. Little quick throws and screens. Cincinnati actually went for it on a fourth and three early in the game. They were stopped early in the game. Right there, I was like, ah, Jackson Mill is going to get the stop. They're going to get the ball. They're going to go up seven. It's just going to keep going from there. Jacksonville's just going to dominate, dominate, dominate. And it never happened. We never saw it. It didn't take place. It was Fugazi. It was pixie dust. It didn't happen. Cincinnati continued to move the ball. Drive after drive after drive. Jake Browning. You thought, okay, first throw was a little fluky. Uh, Maybe the second throw was a tad fluky. Third throw. Fourth throw. Fifth throw. And all of a sudden you're saying, is Jake Browning really that dude? Is he making Joe Burrow look like a system quarterback? Hmm. Interesting. And people are starting to say it on Discord. And people are starting to say it on Twitter. X. Christian Kirk got injured on the first pass of the game for the Jacksonville Jags. That didn't hinder them to go on to have a pretty good offensive day. Christian Kirk, he gets open in a busted coverage. He hurts his groin. He's out for the game. Trey Herndon, their nickel corner, gets hurt. He was questionable to return early in this game. Jacksonville answered by continuously getting the ball to Calvin Ridley. And then Ingram contributed. Parker Washington, rookie receiver, stepped up big time. A guy that I kind of liked coming out. I ranked him, I think, as a top 10 receiver in the class this year. And he was buried on Jacksonville's depth chart. I think he didn't go in the draft to like the sixth or seventh round, which I was shocked by. And he ends up having a big game, wearing number 11, looking like Julian Edelman in the slot out there, working the middle of the field in zone coverages. So the Bengals continuously were hitting Jacksonville with runs, quick passes, and eventually Jacksonville's defense just got sick of it. They got sick of it. And they started to send heat And then on one play, they sent a blitz. Campbell, one-on-one with Jamar Chase. You'd think you'd take that chance every once in a while. Campbell's a good corner. Jamar Chase toasts him for six. A long touchdown. 70-plus yard touchdown. They have the AB touchdown celebration. And Cincinnati, all of a sudden, they're looking like the real deal. And if we're not for Cincinnati having a couple F-ups throughout the game where they're running reverse passes. One play, Jamar Chase is going to pass it. The other play, Tyler Boyd's going to pass it. He throws the ball directly to the other team, just like Jacoby Myers impersonation. If it were not for those things, McPherson hits the crossbar, I think, on a kick. They don't get a fourth down. Like, Like, Jacksonville was fortunate to not lose this game in regulation and possibly not lose this game by multiple scores in the game. Their defense could never get a handle on this game. They could never really slow down the run fully and effectively. They could never really slow down whichever receiver Cincinnati was wanting to throw to, whether it be Tanner Hudson at tight end, Tyler Boyd in the slot, T. Higgins, who was pretty quiet, and especially Jamar Chase, who just continuously was getting the ball. It was only, it was honestly comical. In overtime, Jamar Chase had one of the craziest catches you'll see all year. Triple caught it. Great throw by Jake Browning, JB, Justin Bieber. And then all of a sudden, man, the guy, Jamar Chase, catches it, volleys it, catches it again, and then catches it again as he's falling. Maintaining possession. But Browning played a great game. This might be the best game he ever plays as a pro. But credit Zach Taylor. My big question coming into the game is, how good is Cincinnati's coaching? 
Because I think over the last couple of years, for as good as Cincinnati has been, a lot of people would look at it and say, well, Joe Burrow has been the engine. Joe Burrow has been the straw that stirs the drink. And I think you would still say that primarily the value and the credit deserves to go on Joe Burrow for how he's turned this franchise around. The confidence, the swagger, the belief. But this roster has it throughout, and you saw that in this game. You saw a level of Cincinnati that was like, hey, Jacksonville has never reached the heights we have reached. Just because we don't have our starting quarterback doesn't mean we should be disrespected as 10-point underdogs on Monday Night Football. We're going to show up, we're going to show out, and Jake Browning, this is why you have good receivers. Good receivers and good receiving cores can make play calling right. Good receivers and good receiving cores can make backup quarterbacks look like starters. Good receivers and good receiving cores can make you not want to blitz and change the way that you're play calling. I'm watching the game with my dad and he's like, why doesn't Jacksonville just blitz? And I'm like, well, did you see the blitz that they sent? And Jamar Chase went for 75 yards. That's why they're not blitzing because they're scared to death. When you have Jamar Chase on the outside, when you have Randy Moss on the outside, when you have Tyreek Hill on the outside, teams are not going to want to blitz you that much. They're going to take a chance once or twice a game. But if you burn them, it is going to be a game-changing play. Good receivers make quarterbacks better. Good receivers make play callers better. And good receivers tilt the field. So all these people out there that want to say, you got to build through the offensive line and the defensive line. If there's any team that has proven that inaccurate, right? Offensive line, defensive line, great. But if you have a good quarterback and good receivers, you're going to make a lot of plays in the modern NFL because a lot of this football is flag football. Let's just be fair. We complain about the refs, but we don't adjust our philosophies. Bill Belichick. So you need an offensive line. You need a defensive line. But just as much, if not sometimes more, a great receiving core can make you right a lot. And it changes the game in a way that a great offensive line honestly doesn't. Do you think the Eagles would be the same if they didn't have A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and you put Devontae Parker and Juju Smith-Schuster out there? Do we really think the Eagles would be the same? No, sir. I do not think so. I will give Trevor Lawrence credit for this. Really good at the jump quarterback sneak. He has got a play, just like Drew Brees. It's a little bit of a cheat code. But unfortunately for Trevor Lawrence, the story of the game closing was Trevor Lawrence getting injured, injuring his ankle. Now, apparently it's an ankle sprain. So that doesn't sound bad. Maybe it's a high ankle sprain, which would mean he might be out for three, four weeks, which Jacksonville should be able to survive and be able to still make the playoffs. But that's a little bit up in the air given the Texans. This loss, like if if Jacksonville would have won this game, it would have been huge for them, right? Just in terms of allowing Trevor Lawrence to recover. I'm not sure what the timeline is going to be like, but at least it's not a broken ankle. At least it wasn't a knee. Like, there could have been much worse injuries here for Trevor Lawrence. But that being said, if it's a sprained ankle, it could be three, four weeks. I'm not sure if he could play on it. I don't know. Uh, Potentially. But, man, super impressed with Zach Taylor. Super impressed with the play calling tonight by the Bengals. Super impressed by Cincinnati's players stepping up. Jamar Chase. Huge game, awesome game, showing up, showing out. Joe Mixon, those two guys to me were the stars of the game. Jacksonville looks fraudulent regardless of Trevor Lawrence or no Trevor Lawrence. They didn't look like a contender tonight. The way that their defense was giving up big time yards and big time points to Jake Browning, highly, highly disappointing. You're at home, you're a double digit favorite. Disappointing stuff from Jacksonville. So that's my Monday Night Football takeaway. Overall, entertaining game, fun game, which I wish I'd been, uh, wish I would have been live for it. But overall, Trevor Lawrence getting hurt definitely put a downer on it. Jacksonville's going to have to adjust. 
That was a wacky game. Didn't expect to be saying that we would see Jake Browning and C.J. Beathard playing in this game before the season. I would have been extremely depressed if you would have told me that before the year. But it actually ended up being a pretty good game. The final point I want to make about this is how many screens is Jackson Mill going to throw? Can you please tell me in the comment section how many screens will Trevor Lawrence throw? I mean, this guy, it, it feels like every time I watch him, he throws the ball down the field every 10 plays. Otherwise, it looks like he's still at Clemson and he throws a bubble screen horizontally every other play. It's hard to evaluate a quarterback who has that much talent when he's throwing the ball sideways for 90% of the game. And then he throws the ball down the field every once in a while. And even my dad said it. He's like, there's something missing with this guy. Like, Trevor Lawrence. It's like his brain is like a little slow or he like is too quick to make the wrong decision at times. Like he's too quick to scramble or too quick to throw the ball away or too quick to throw to a guy. He's very impatient as a player. And then at the same time, he's very zoned in on what he's supposed to do mechanically and he's not exactly open to making the alternative play. So he's an interesting player. And I have the task again tomorrow on Bleacher Report of ranking the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL. And Trevor Lawrence was right in the mix to being my number 10. Unfortunately, he got hurt, so I won't be ranking him. But those were the things I was thinking about throughout the game. On the page to a love letter, shall we? <laughs> the love story of the Green Bay Packers. Whooping! The Kansas City Chiefs candy ass all over Lambeau Field. I mean, come on. Who doesn't love that? Woohoo! The Packers go back, go. I need to get a sound effect for the Packers or something, man. We had Jordan Love. I love me some Jordan Love when he's playing like this, slinging the football. You know, that little release, slinging the football like Aaron Rodgers. Slinging that football around. Christian Watson, my boy, coming through with not one, but two touchdowns on the best secondary in the league. Screw that secondary. We got Christian Watson, bitches. The Packers took it to the Super Bowl champs, those Kansas City Chiefs. That was fun to watch. And not only did the Packers whoop that candy ass, but they beat them from pillar to post. This was the Green Bay Packers beating the Chiefs. Not through a fluke. Not through the referee patch interference. Not through anything like that. Like the Chiefs fans will tell you, oh, you know, Valdez Scantling can't catch. Valdez Scantling got interfered with. Hell Mary interference. First of all, nobody calls any interference on a Hell Mary. Nobody calls interference on a Hail Mary. Gronk literally got his helmet torn off. He got absolutely, I don't want to say the word, taken down. He got suplex like Brock Lesnar suplex city. And he still didn't get a call. So I don't want to hear nothing about no Hail Mary. Okay? I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to hear anything about a damn pass interference. Why do I not want to hear anything? Because Valdez Scanling is a little bitch. That's why. I don't want to hear shit about MVS. Why? Because he's going up for the ball and he doesn't even contest the football. He doesn't even make a play for the ball. How are you going to get a call when you don't even try to get the fucking call? Okay? Put that through your skulls right now. That's not interference. Why? The, the corner is trying to play the ball. He's trying to get to the ball. The receiver's not doing shit. He's just waiting for a flag. Now, back to the agenda. Christian Watson's a dog. And I'm tired of people, all the first like six, seven weeks of the season. This guy sucks. He's just a one-trick pony. He's MVS. He's the MVS 2.0. Oh, shut your fucking ass up. Shove it up your ass. We saw MVS. We saw Christian Watson. Two touchdowns. Who looked better to you? Who looks like who? Come on, baby. Come on. Shove it up your ass. We've got Watson owning this secondary that did a good job against Tyreek Hill, who we'll talk about later in the video. 
Um, but this Kansas City defense, they looked like ass. Like, I'm not even going to lie. They looked terrible in this game. This was one of their worst performances all year. They couldn't stop the run consistently. A.J. Dillon was taking their lunch. Quadzilla was running through them. They couldn't stop the speed of the Packers receivers from Reed to Romeo Dobbs was kind of quiet. We had uh, the other kid, uh, the rookie. I forgot his name. It's not coming to mind. And then we, of course, Watson. Like these guys were running past these dudes. Wicks. That's his name. Uh, The backup rookie tight end had a good game. Jordan Love, man, composed a lot more accurate. And that's where I see some some big improvement. I see him not panic. I see him trust the process. I see him trust the offense. I see Matt LaFleur trusting him, Jordan Love, which was a big problem for me. You guys know this if you watch this show. Big problem for me was not just Jordan Love's play and his inaccuracy and his lack of fundamental mechanics, especially with his feet. He's still off a lot. He's still really bad with his sloppy mechanics down low. He gets away with it a lot because he's got a strong arm. He's got a fast release. And he can overcome it a lot. And his receivers are making plays on the ball quite often now. But it feels like he has toned down the amount of inaccurate passes. He's toned down uh, some of the dumb decisions. He's grown through his play on the field. And Matt LaFleur has honed in on what works for him. And it really feels like they found an identity on offense. A lot of motion. A lot of horizontal stuff. A lot of horizontal stuff in the run game. First play of the game, I knew that Matt LaFleur was on one with his fresh haircut when he ran like a a fake handoff pitch reverse play uh, to Reed, I think it was potentially, on the first play of the game. And they get a good Good, nice gain on first down. I knew that Matt LaFleur was in his bag when I saw that shit. I said, oh boy, we've got a good game. I should have bet more on Packers plus six. That's exactly what I said to myself in that moment. The Chiefs, they absolutely fucking suck, okay? Patrick Mahomes has scored less than 21 points. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times, not six times. Seven times this year, less than 21 points. Lewis Riddick is on Twitter saying, oh, this is the best quarterback that's come out in the last 30 years. Get your head checked. Get your eyes examined, okay? Pearl Vision Center gives you free eye examinations. Please watch the damn game. What are you watching? 21 points. Less than that. Seven times. Tom Brady never did that shit back in the, when you could kill people with Rishay Caldwell, bro. Come on. Give me the, give me these mistakes. Give me these, these guys. He's still got Kelsey on his team. He's got Taylor Swift in the freaking stands. He's got Simone Biles watching him. He can't put up 21 against Joe Barry. Joe Barry? Come on, bro. I've been making fun of Joe Barry for like four years. Kyle Shanahan literally owns his freaking soul. Okay? The Packers are going to make the playoffs. The Packers are going to be the sixth seed in the NFC. I've already told you that. I told you that live on the BR app. And if you're not on, follow me on the BR app. I don't know what you're doing. If you're not tuning into the live Bleacher Report live streams, I would highly appreciate it, honestly. That would be very, very nice of you because I'm trying to uh, do well over there because then obviously I'll get more and that will be great and that will get my name out there and my brand out there. So you guys win, I win. It's great stuff, okay? And it's good content. I'm telling you, it's good stuff and it's not gonna be on YouTube, so you'll never find it, okay? But six seed, I told you, the Packers are gonna make it. I told you before the year the Packers were going to make the playoffs. And yes, I had a little bit of moment of weakness, okay? I was down bad. I had a moment of weakness. Jordan Love let me down. He broke my heart for a second there. But Cupid came right back with an arrow in the form of Christian Watson and sparked me. I'm back. 
Go Pack Go. Now the Chiefs, they've got to figure this thing out or else they're going to lose the first playoff game they play. They have to get the ball to Pacheco as much as possible. They have to get the ball to Rice. They have to get the ball to Kelsey as much as possible. I I don't want to keep watching Mahomes run around in circles every play. Like, can we get some rhythm to the offense? Can we get some some substance to this offense? You're lucky you played the Packers. Like, I think people thought the Chiefs on a per-play, per-drive basis performed better this game, and that is factual. That is statistics. But what they're missing is that the the local high school team could run the ball on the Packers. So that's what they're missing, right? The Chiefs are not going to be able to run this football on the Ravens the way that they did against the Packers. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Jawan Taylor, I told you that was a shit signing. All right, Ben, I told you. He false starts every play. He's trash. He was trash in Jacksonville. Jacksonville doesn't miss him one iota. They're putting up points with C.J. Beathard, yet Patrick Mahomes can't put up points with Jawan Taylor. And then at the end of this damn game, bro, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to Chris Collinsworth have his head so far up Patrick Mahomes' ass that he's talking about, where's the call? Where's the call? This man literally said, where's the call? Mike Tirico, literally on live television, said, where are the calls for the Chiefs? I am not exaggerating. This happened. I am not making this up. I am not being an ass. This actually happened. The two commentators on live television were talking about how the Chiefs got screwed by the refs. I am not exaggerating. Speaking of a team that always gets the call, it's the Chiefs. Every single damn time. This time it didn't happen, and we've got the two commentators, Chris Collinsworth, who's who's sucking Patrick Mahomes off from pillar to post, from first play to the last play. It doesn't matter what the guy does. He does a, a pirouette in the pocket. He, da- he talks to Andy Reid on the sideline. He scrambles for a first down. It doesn't matter what the guy does. He gets sucked off by Collinsworth. Then you've got Mike Tirico, Who's over there? I don't know what he, I don't know what got into him. I respected Mike Tirico until this moment. What was that about, bro? Take them, throw them off a cliff. I don't want to see them anymore. Throw them out the window, throw the key away. I don't want to see it. I've heard the Chiefs are inevitable. The Chiefs were inevitable. The Patrick Mahomes is inevitable. Inevitably, they are going to lose. That's what's inevitably going to happen. Okay? I can't take this. The Packers are legit. Believe in the shield. All right, next. We've got the Niners. Woo! Bang, bang. I feel like Cactus Jack. The Niners got their revenge from the NFC Championship. And I heard Stephen A., the great Stephen A. Smith, legend, goat, Whatever you may call him, say this. You have to think about does this delegitimize? Does this strip away the Eagles NFC Championship from 2022? Does this make us think differently about that NFC Championship victory? Because the Niners went into Philadelphia and they layeth the smack of downeth on. The Philadelphia Eagles. So bad. Philadelphia has not been beaten that bad since Mr. T predicted pain. Since Clubber Lang smacked Rocky all over the ring in Rocky 3. That's how bad the 49ers beat the crap out of the Philadelphia Eagles. And I understand that Rocky won in the end. But hey, it's not the point. Okay, it's not the point. You're missing the point. The ultimate point here is that is there an asterisk next to the Eagles NFC Championship? And therefore, the ultimate point is, is there an asterisk next to the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl win? That is the point. That is the point. Think about that for a second. Ingest it. Digest it.
Now let's resume. Now, we must say this. The 49ers trash-talked all week long. They talked their trash. They talked their talk. They walked their walk. They wore black. Every single one of them. From Trent Williams to Christian McCaffrey to Debo Samuel. They all wore black to Philadelphia. It was fucking Rocky Day in Philadelphia. They wore black for the funeral of the Philadelphia Eagles. And then they resumed to check them into the San Francisco Smackdown Hotel. That's what they did. They they put these boys so far deep into the earth. I don't even know what to say. I feel like the Eagles cannot come back from it. I honestly feel like the Eagles were beat so bad that they will not be able to come back from it. I honestly feel like they're going to get a corpse. The Dallas Cowboys are going to have a corpse of a Philadelphia team this week. I feel bad for the Eagles. They were beaten so bad. And you have to say that their, their mental capacity will be tested. Their mental toughness will be tested. Their fortitude, their, their manhood will be tested. How will they come back from this? Because they were beat so bad. And this is the thing, right? Everybody on the shows, because I'm listening, I, I loved it. You know, I loved the Niners winning that game. They won me a fuck ton of money. It was awesome. John said, don't bet on the Niners. Don't bet on the Niners. Okay, John, yeah, you you do you. You bet on your Eagles. You do you. I bet on the Niners. I, Christmas presents for everybody. That's all I got to say, all right? And then what happens, Okay. We're hearing a lot of love for the roster of the Niners on ESPN, on uh, Chris, uh, what's his name? Colin Cowherd, Colin Cowherd talking about the Niners roster, the Niners roster, the Niners roster. Everybody's talking about Niners, Fox Sports, the Niners roster, the Niners roster. Do you know what the difference is between these teams? Do you know? Because quarterback, I've heard Jalen Hurts is MVP because he has grown men, 300-pound men, push his ass into the end zone 12 times. I've heard that Jalen Hurts is the MVP. So quarterback clearly belongs to the Eagles. Running back position, you'd give that to the Niners. Okay, Wide receiver, A.J. Brown's been arguably a top three receiver this year in the NFL. Devontae Smith is a Heisman Trophy winner. And he is very good in the NFL. And then you've got an offensive line. I know they didn't have Dallas Goddard, but they've got receivers and an offensive line that's one of the best we've seen in modern football and a defensive line that had the most sacks in NFL history last year. A secondary with multi-time all-pro Darius Slay, yada, yada, yada. You bring in Kevin Byard. You know what the difference is? Niners have talent. Niners got great players. There's no denying it. They've got future Hall of Famer after future Hall of Famer. But even the Niners players would admit that the difference is the coaches. Because on one sideline, you've got in my opinion a mascot. You got Nick Sirianni's ass. And honestly, he makes Italians look bad. I'm Italian. You think I want to be re represented by this clown? What does he even do? What does Nick Sirianni do on a game day? Other than yell at people, set up his bodyguard to get other people kicked out of the game. Bro, control your bodyguard, your buddy Dom off the corner. Uh, where, where'd you get this fucking clown? Like, where'd you get this Dom fella? By the way, in any other sport, I come from, okay, I'm Canadian, bro. And, uh, you know, a lot of my sport existence was had on you know, in lacrosse and hockey, and there's benches. So it's a little bit different in football. While football, you know, it's a physical sport. Those sports are physical as well. I coach lacrosse. So it's a little bit different in terms of the player to coach kind of dynamic. In that sport, you would be penalized for that. You would be kicked out. In any other sport, I mean, soccer, you would be probably like kicked out of the damn league. Um, basketball, I mean, they want no altercations whatsoever. You'll be suspended for life. Baseball, you might be, uh, 
s s never be able to get in the Hall of Fame. I mean, these things are just... I don't know how a guy named fucking Dom the Pizza Guy, I don't know who this guy is, absolute clown, is allowed on the corner beside Nick Sirianni talking to Dre Greenlaw. Dre Greenlaw, bro, this guy starts the fight. This clown. Get this fucking guy off my TV. Get this guy off the side. Like, why is he there? Is Nick Sirianni such a pussy that he needs a bodyguard? What, is he going to be beat up by Trent Williams live on air? That's not going to happen. Why? Why would that happen? Is he that scared of Kyle Shanahan massacring him on a football field that he needs a bodyguard to protect him? Bro, why do you have a bodyguard on the fucking football field? What? What? Am I missing something? What? What's going on here? I don't understand. Okay, what is this Dom guy going to do? He'd probably get his ass kicked by Dre Greenlaw, who is a psycho. Okay, Dre Greenlaw is a proven psychopath. He is going to get his ass kicked. Regardless, the man would probably have a heart attack. He's probably had one too many Philly subs. One too many cheesesteaks. All right, this guy is going to lose his shit. And probably shit a brick when Dre Greenlaw gets over there. But... I mean, I don't even know where to go now. Like, Kyle Shanahan beat the shit out of Nick Sirianni. And that's the difference between these two teams. There's mastery on one side and, and quite literally, potentially the best offensive coach I've ever seen in my life, uh, which is Kyle Shanahan. I'm not willing to go to the best coach. But he, think about it this way, guys. I know that you guys don't like me saying this stuff, but... Kyle Shannon, I think he's like 43. Bill Belichick didn't win his first Super Bowl until he was 48, and he had Tom Brady. Okay? Kyle Shannon's been to a Super Bowl, three NFC championships. He's like 43 years old. He already has a better winning percentage than his dad. And I know that his dad has two Super Bowls. But, like, what's the trajectory for this guy? I'm just thinking about this. But that's the difference for me between these two teams. It's, it's the coaching. Like, they're, they're both extremely talented. It's the coaching. That's the difference. You got two great teams. You got a mascot on one side that needs a fucking bodyguard. And on the other side, you've got Kyle Shanahan. And Steve Wilkes. Give Steve Wilkes some credit. But, bro, the Eagles can't stop the forward pass. The first quarter, I'm not going to lie, a little nerve-wracking. It looked a lot like the NFC Championship last year. But for the Niners to go down 6-0 in this game, stop the Eagles in the red zone when they needed to, get the ball in the second, third, fourth quarter, and just dominate. I mean, dominate. They punt, punt in the first quarter. Punt, punt. That's how the game starts for the Niners. Then they proceed to lay six, six touchdowns in a row. Punt, punt, touchdown, 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 touchdown. That's how the game ended. Punt, punt, touchdown, 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 touchdown. This looks like a dominant Super Bowl team. This is the type of team I like to watch on Sundays. I don't like to watch that little carny, cartoon, Kansas City Chief team. Okay? My chair has always been low the whole damn video, bro. I look short like freaking dom uh the niners good stat from rex ryan plus 49 huh that's funny an explosive play differential this season no team is even close the eagles were so scared after they watched the film yesterday that they signed washed darius leonard when i'm done the dishes at my house i just yell darius leonard that's what i do i recommend you do that as well the San Francisco 49ers knew the Eagles couldn't cover them. They just continued to attack. Ayuk on the outside. Debo, my goodness, a dog. I think he had like four catches for like three touchdowns. He was, had a Randy Moss game. Four catches for like 140 yards and three touchdowns. Don't quote me on that, but it was pretty darn close to that. And he was talking the most trash out of everybody and nobody on the damn field could tackle him. He said, you can't tackle me. I'm more man than you. He went into their house 
He talked shit and he put three touchdowns on their ass. That was impressive. That was impressive. The Niners have beat the crap out of the Cowboys and the and the Eagles at home and on the road. You'll see where I have them in the power rankings in terms of the Eagles and the Cowboys. But here's the thing, guys. I told you this would happen, right? I'm not like these other shows. Like, I see so many people, like, the headline being, are the Niners the best team in the league? I'm looking at these damn podcasts and these damn YouTube shows and the ESPN and all this stuff. I'm like, brother, the the Niners have been the best team in the league since week one. Have I been missing something here? What have I been missing? And, and I'm not trying to proclaim that they're going to go on and easily win the Super Bowl because that's not easy to do. Would I pick them to win the Super Bowl? Absolutely, I would. Absolutely, as I did before the year. But like for people to sit here and say, are the Niners the best team in the league with a question mark? Are you people on Coke? Like, what are you on? Are you on crack cocaine? Like, what, what are you doing with your life? How, how much examination does that question really need? Please examine your life choices if you think that the Niners are not the best team in the NFL. Let's move on. January Joe is back, baby. The Cleveland Browns actually got a spark on offense when January the elite Joe Flacco entered the building in Los Angeles. But unfortunately, not even Joe Flacco could save the Cleveland Browns from Matthew Stafford and Puka Nakua and Sean McVay. The Rams beat the Browns uh, in the fourth quarter pretty good. The game was pretty close for a majority of the day. Matthew Stafford, just want to point out a quick stat for you, playing like a top 10 quarterback right now. Seven touchdowns in two weeks. Three last week, four this week. Four against the best defense, supposedly, in the NFL. And honestly, January Joe was pretty good. I thought Joe Flacco actually played pretty well in that game against the Rams. You know, he made a nice scramble in the third quarter, scramble on the run, made a nice throw for a first down. He made a tight window throw to uh, Harrison Bryant early in the game, right on him, put the ball right on him. And the thing with Flacco that I think is is different from a P.J. Walker and definitely a Thompson Robinson is the experience and the knowledge of the rest of the team understanding that Joe Flacco has experience. He's been there. He's done that. He's won games. He's been in these situations. And Flacco simply took over the huddle, took over the offense, and actually threw the ball well, threw the ball accurately, threw the ball still with some mustard to it. Uh, Certainly didn't lack arm strength. He lacked it a little bit when he was under pressure and when he was forced to change his, his mechanics and his feet. Like, when he was able to set and throw, he was good. Um, But the thing with Flacco at this point is he has, like, negative mobility. Like, he can't move at all. He is literally a statue. So if you get him off his spot, he's in danger. Um, But ultimately, we saw Matthew Stafford make some really nice throws. And I think the thing we see from Matthew Stafford week in and week out is his ability to be right no matter what the coverage is. Right, like he can make all the throws and he makes you wrong even if you're in tight coverage. He puts the ball in places and he has his entire career that I think only real ball watchers understand and and don't get your mind in the gutter there. Understand that Matthew Stafford can make that throw. And that Matthew Stafford is that dude because he could make that throw. One that comes to mind is a corner route I think it was to Nakua down the right sideline. I think it was relatively early in the game. But he just puts it perfectly over the top of the corner into the hands of Nakua for a first down. It's those type of throws that make a huge difference when you're primarily a pocket passer. But this game was very close throughout. You know, 13-13 with five minutes left in the third quarter. 20-19 to where Hopkins for the Browns missed an extra point with 8.49 left in the game. 20 to 19. And the Rams went on to close the game. Williams continues to be one of the better running backs in the NFL this year. When he plays, it's a true difference maker for the Rams. He is the real deal Holyfield in that backfield. 
John Johnson actually got a pick against his former team, which I thought was hilarious because the Browns paid him so much money to be an elite safety and he never ended up being one. Cooper Cup didn't look very good in this game. I felt like he looked pretty injured and beat up. So that's something to monitor moving forward. Um, but the Rams closed the game out with a stop on fourth and five with 229 left when they were up eight points. Then they went down the field and Sean McVay said, for all you Williams owners out there, we got you another touchdown to help your fantasy team. So that was very nice because I have Williams in a couple leagues. But I'm impressed by the Rams offense. I think they have a top five, top seven offense in the NFL when they have all their weapons. Their run game's working really well. I thought that was really what sparked this win for them early in the game. Their defense made enough plays to win this game. And for the Browns, I feel like Joe Flacco looked better than the alternatives. Other than, you know, like Joe Deshaun Watson wasn't very good, but obviously he was their starter. Joe Flacco looked better than the backups that they had in previously. So I would stick with Joe Flacco until, you know, he really has a bad game. Um, but their their defense is clearly going to have to win them games. And this was another example of Cleveland going on the road against a good offense and not showing up and not playing good enough on defense. I know that they didn't have Denzel Ward and Miles Garrett's beat up, and I bet on the Rams because of it. But their defense needs to play better for them to win these games. Next. The Broncos finally lose. So the Denver Broncos took on the Houston Texans in a huge AFC wildcard game. And seemingly a huge game for the Houston Texans now with Trevor Lawrence getting injured potentially to win their division. I mean, it's still up in the air now. First of all, please no. Please, God, no. Please, no. Why Tank Dell? Please, anybody else. Take, take Turtle. Take Durkant. Take Ultra. Take Lenny. Please take Sing. Anybody but Tank Dell. Please. Please. Caesar will volunteer. Anybody but Tank Dell. Why? Why did we have to do this? No. Not allowed. This shouldn't be legal. Give me back Tank Dell. Not allowed. Now, the Denver Broncos almost won this game. I don't know how, but they almost won this game. Okay. Let's go through the game, my notes on the game. I spent time thoroughly watching it. So let's go through note by note, and I'll give you my thoughts, all right? It's a deep dive type of notepad here. Cortland Sutton, early in the game, first drive of the game. Denver gets the ball. Sutton drops the ball on a deep pass early. And something that I've appreciated about Russell Wilson this year is his his ability and want to throw the ball down the field. And Cortland Sutton's been his guy. And Cortland Sutton had an amazing catch later in this game. That got them a touchdown and got them within distance later in the game. But there was one early in the game. I want to say it was second down, second play of the game, something like that. And Denver goes for a shot and it just goes off his hands and he barely misses it. And he, he It is a drop. But man, that would have been a huge play to start off this game. The first punt of the game ends up being partly blocked by the Texans. Texans get the good field position because of it. The new playmaker who stepped up in, in you know, Dalton Schultz not playing in this game, Brevin Jordan, their tight end that they've used the last couple of years, he had a big role in this game. And he looked like a new playmaker for them. Quick, fast, physical, you know, very good athlete in space, really showed up in a way that Dalton Schultz is a more refined, more well-rounded, better overall tight end. But Brevin Jordan's a good, good athlete. And now with Tank Dell getting injured, I wouldn't be surprised if the Houston Texans utilized more two tight end personnel with how well Brevin Jordan really looked in this game. He looked really good. Third and one at the 10 on the first drive and Stroud kind of floats the ball to his fullback. And it just goes off one of the hands of the fullback. He could have potentially caught that. I feel like if that's the receiver, he probably catches it. But it's a fullback who's not exactly the most acrobatic. Um, you know, maybe Stroud could have delivered that in a different fashion on that throw. But it was one of those plays where he was rolling out to the left. And there was a defender in his face. And he had to kind of like float the ball over top. And it just went a little high for the fullback to catch. Regardless, that ends up being a field goal instead of potentially a touchdown because of that missed opportunity. 
McGlinchey, the right tackle for the Denver Broncos, formerly of the 49ers. He's a terrible football player. He was beat like a drum by Will Anderson uh, early in this game for a sack. He also, you know, Anderson, Will Anderson was one of the best players in this game. He caused an interception with a batted pass that landed in Derek Stingley's hands. That was a huge play to add the Texans points late in this game. Uh, Anderson also got two sacks in the game, another one later on where he was kind of a free rusher, but he was able to take down Russell Wilson. Nico Collins had an amazing game. On offense, I I felt like the best players in this game, Will Anderson on defense, Derek Stingley as well was phenomenal, had two interceptions, one extremely acrobatic one down the field late in this game, which was huge to close it out. But Nico Collins was the best player on offense. He was making play after play down the field, especially when Tank Dell went down. Nico Collins stepped up even more. That was impressive. The Broncos, story of the game for them. They went 0 for 11 on third down, which is just flat out embarrassing. Russell Wilson couldn't make a play. He was getting pressured a lot. And they didn't seem to have the answers to the Texans' coverage schemes. It felt like there wasn't a lot of guys open. It felt like more than usual, Russell Wilson was having to hold on to the ball. Uh, more than usual than of late, I would say, throughout the last couple of games for the Broncos. Third and two inside the 10-yard line, Stroud scrambles to the right to hit Collins, but again, another drop in the end zone. That could have potentially been a touchdown right there. Um, I do believe the Texans end up going for it and scoring anyways, but that was a a nice play. Or maybe they didn't. I don't quite remember if if the game started 6-0 or not. But Stroud had a really nice play where he scrambled to the right and he hit Collins and and it was a tough, it was a good coverage by the Broncos, really tight coverage. But it was one of those plays where it was like this, it just went off his hands. That was close. Uh, big question for me moving forward for the Texans is how do they replace Tank Dell? He's been such an electric player with the ball in his hands and down the field and he has a very good connection and chemistry with CJ Stroud. So my question is, I would say tight ends, more tight end formations, more two tight end, three tight end formations, more John Mechie, more Robert Woods, not quite as twitchy, not quite as quick or fast as a guy like uh, Tank Dell. But I think Mechie probably has more of that in his arsenal. I think Noah Brown could make up for a lot of that as well as Nico Collins. But Robert Woods has also been fairly reliable within this offense as well. I thought the Texans ran the ball a lot more than I would have expected. 23 runs from their running backs. Highly ineffective for the most part, but they kind of kept Denver at bay with their pass rush. Just enough running to kind of keep it in the back of their minds um, and enough efficiency on those runs. Again, Damian Pierce fails to be really efficient on the runs. Jonathan Harris on the Broncos, I thought was really impressive on their defensive line. Alex Singleton had a very good game. And I felt like uh, the entire secondary of the Broncos was pretty competitive. They allowed a pretty, you know, a couple plays where Stroud was able to escape and make plays down the field vertically as he always does, which is typical now of a C.J. Stroud game. But overall, I thought they played pretty well. Um, The Broncos just didn't get enough done on offense, really, right? The score was 16-3 to with eight minutes left in the third. So that just speaks to the efficiency of the offense. The Texans actually won this game with their defense with their pressure from their front four. Sheldon Rankins collapsing the middle of the pocket. Will Anderson getting to the quarterback. Greener getting to the quarterback. Sacking Russell Wilson. Causing Russell Wilson to scramble, throw the ball away. Uh, The Texans' ability to stop the run and not really allow the Broncos to run all over them and dictate the pace of the game, which was huge. Really, this game felt like the Texans were the better team all day long, but the Broncos found a way to stay in the game, get the ball in the end, only be down by five points, 22 to 17, after a long connection to Cortland Sutton. And then Russ gets the ball, starts driving down the field as he was doing the last couple of weeks. And the Texans defense came through. The Texans defense came through with an interception in the back of the end zone, which was forced by, again, another pressure where they got three pressures in a row on the three biggest plays of the game. Pressure after pressure after pressure. Russell Wilson was scrambling around, forced to make a play, throws it up in the end zone, and it gets picked off. Jimmy Ward got the game ceiling interception, which was cool to see in D'Amico. The one thing I really like about D'Amico is he celebrates with his team. He's very animated. Um, he, he is very much in the game. He is a, somewhat a player's coach, I would say. 
and he's got that young energy vibe to him. I think he brings a lot to this team in terms of the edge, the energy, the positivity, uh, pointing this young team in the right direction, giving them a lot to work with, obviously defensively from a scheme standpoint where I felt like the Texans defense was very well prepared against the Broncos. But I feel like from an overall team standpoint, D'Amico does a lot from an energy and vibes perspective, kind of like Dan Campbell for the Lions. He was very animated in this game. And, and that was cool to see from a coaching standpoint. Moving on. The Pittsburgh Steelers lost to who? Yeah, the Pittsburgh Steelers lost to uh, the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, WTF, what the hell is that? I mean, let's just pray, guys. Let's pray. To the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, please, I beg of you, if it's the last thing you do, please do not allow the Pittsburgh Steelers to make the playoffs. I will give you the guitar-loving teen Jordan Hunter as tribute. Please, God. Do not, do not please allow the Pittsburgh Steelers to make the playoffs. Now, God, I understand they play the New England Patriots. Quite possibly the worst team I've ever seen in my life. Quite, po quite possibly the worst offense I have ever seen in my life. They have scored 34 points in four weeks. I get it. But the total is 31 and a half. Mitchell Trubisky is starting. There's anything and any game that the Patriots could win. God, please let it be this one. Please let the Patriots whoop that candy ass so bad that the Pittsburgh Steelers are eliminated from the playoffs. Let's get it done, Pats Nation. Beat the Steelers. They are unwatchable. They are so bad. We cannot allow them in the playoffs. It will not happen. It cannot happen. The Patriots must do the deed. 31 and a half is the total. Win this game 10 to 3, baby. Take it. Kenny Pickett injured. Mitchell Trubisky in. Bailey Zap Zappy in the game. Get it done. On a serious note, Pittsburgh Steelers literally lost to the Arizona Cardinals, which is extremely embarrassing. Uh, Trey McBride was their daddy in this game, catching pass after pass after pass. The Cardinals were attacking the Steelers' defense through the run game, through play action with Kyler Murray getting him outside the pocket, and through passes over the middle of the field, especially to Trey McBride, where they took advantage of the Steelers' weakness at linebacker, safety, in the middle of the field, attacking, attacking, attacking the middle of the field. There was a fourth and goal at the one pretty early in this game that Arizona stopped Pittsburgh. That was a turning point in this game. There was a low snap fumble by Mitchell Trubisky in this game. When he entered the game, that was a turning point in this game. The weather delay impacted this not once, but twice, maybe three times throughout the game. There was random rain like throughout each quarter. Uh, but this game was 24-3 to Arizona with eight minutes left. This is a Pittsburgh Steelers team that is above 500, that is expecting to make the playoffs. They were down 24-3 to to the team that had the second overall pick in the NFL draft. That is extremely embarrassing. They are shit. Do not allow them to make the playoffs. They will get embarrassed. It will be unwatchable television. Everyone will say, oh, Mike Tomlin's the greatest coach of all time for making the playoffs with Kenny Pickett. But in fact, he's going to get embarrassed in the first game of the playoffs, probably by like the Dolphins or some shit. And they'll be like 100-3. And I don't want to watch it. Probably the Chiefs. Again. <laughs> no, you know what? Before we get to him. Let's get to him. Stop the shenanigans. Stop the nonsense. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear about tush push 
Jalen Hurts, Dakota Prescott playing losing team after losing team after weak defense after weak de- Well, yippee ki you could score 40 points against the damn Washington Commanders. So can Tua, bro. You can beat the Seahawks. <laughs> Brock Purdy has got the greatest team. He's got the greatest coach. He's got the greatest receivers. Love Brock Purdy to death. But Purdy hurts. Definitely not Mahomes. Don't even bring his name up. Please. If you bring that name up, I will boot you. Out of this chat. There is no chat. But I will boot you. The only other guy that could possibly be put in this conversation doesn't have a good enough record because his coach is ass. And we know who that is. The MVP of the NFL is not Purdy, Hurts, Dak, your mom. It's Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is the MVP of the NFL. If you don't think so, you rather do not watch football. You definitely don't watch the Miami Dolphins. Or you just don't care about the sport. Because Tyreek Hill is the ultimate field tilter. He tilts the field. Think about the Miami offense. You can't play man coverage. We saw Washington play man coverage against the Miami Dolphins. First third down of the game, 75-yard touchdown by Tyreek Hill. See ya. Like Debo Samuel to the Eagles fans. See you later. Ron Rivera with one of the single worst. (laughs) One of the worst game plans since Brandon Staley. He played man coverage in the first half against the fastest team I've ever seen in my life. Good work, Staley. Good work. I mean Rivera. Good work. So when you look at Tyreek Hill, what does he allow the Dolphins to do? He makes the life of the quarterback easy. He makes Tua's life easy. Why? Because Tua consistently throws floaters up into the air. He doesn't even know. He just says, ah, fuck it. Tyreek's down there somewhere. He just throws the ball up. I mean, the second Tyreek touchdown, it looks like he's a... He's he's trying to track the ball down in there. He's... And he finds it, and he's got a touchdown. And the first one, I mean, the ball is just a duck. And it looks like Tyree Kill comes back to it. He fair catches it. He catches it, and then he runs for a touchdown. It's every week with this fucking guy. He's open by 10 yards. He comes back to the ball. He makes your quarterback right every single time because he's so open. His route running, his speed, his quickness, his, his acceleration. I've never seen a receiver... This fast and this quick with the acceleration and the physical strength in his body, which he is not a big guy, but he has so much strength within that little body of his. And he is so explosive. He is the most explosive NFL player I've ever seen. He is the MVP. He makes your quarterback better because the quarterback never has to throw a good ball. He catches it over two people. He'll run past you. You can give him a screen. You can give him a handoff. It could be a touchdown. It could be. I mean, it makes the play caller's job easier. Because why? Well, you could just call every clutch play and design it for Tyreek Hill. Fourth down and one, throw him a screen. How many times have the Dolphins done that this year? Third down and 10, just throw the ball on a go route to Tyreek Hill. Throw a post to Tyreek Hill. First down drive starter, run a play action RPO. Tyree Kill on a slant, runs for 30 yards. You can't play man coverage because Tyree Kill's too fast and too quick and gets open too easy. You can't blitz because fuck, you got the fastest guy on earth running down the left sideline wide open and I could throw it. You, you have to play a specific way. You have to have two deep. You have to have safety over top. You have to have double coverage. You have to have some sort of tilted coverage towards number 10 or you're fucked. That is why Tyreek Hill is the MVP. He's a force multiplier. He makes the quarterback better. He makes the play caller better. He makes the offensive line better because they see less dynamic blitzes. 
He makes the quarterback better because they see less safety rotation. When you have Tyree Kill, you can't rotate your safeties like a madman because what if Tyree Kill runs straight and your safety's in the box and now you've got single high? Now I'm done. I'm toast. I can throw the ball as long as I'm a competent quarterback. So it's easy on the safety rotation. It's easy on the blitz because how much are they really going to want to blitz? And you usually know in big situations if the defense is proper, they're going to double him, which is going to allow Braxton Berrios to be better. It's going to allow your tight end to be better. Smythe, whoever it is at this point. Raheem Mostert, your running game is going to be better because you got too deep all the time. So your running game is better. Jalen Waddle obviously is going to benefit as a one number one receiver in his own right. You look at Jalen Waddle, very good football player. He looks like uh, Devontae Parker compared to this man. Okay? I mean, Tyreek's down there somewhere. And the defense, they're staying up at night to watch this guy, to fear this guy, to game plan for this guy. He makes your quarterback better, your run game better, your play caller better, your team better. He could score in one play. He's the MVP. And if you need further evidence... Tyreek Hill has more receiving yards than every single Cardinals wide receiver. Tyreek Hill has more receiving yards than every single Patriots wide receiver. Tyreek Hill has more receiving yards than every Giants wide receiver. Tyreek Hill has more receiving yards than every Jets receiver. Tyreek Hill has more receiving yards than every Atlanta Falcon receiver. Tyreek Hill in yards per route run is currently setting a record. According to Ian Harditz, the most yards per route run this year, Tyree Kill at 4.27, which is 1.26 yards more than number two Brandon Ayuk. Are you serious? I'll say that again. 4.27 yards per route run is 1.26 yards per route run more than second place. Who, by the way, that guy plays in a Kyle Shanahan offense. Tyreek Hill is MVP. Now let's get to a guy that is not MVP. Not even freaking close, bro. Can we fire Bill Belichick yet? Please, for the love of God, fire this old, senile, piece of crap co uh, coach. Guy is trash. He is senile. He doesn't know offense. Guys, legitimately, I've been saying this for weeks. Bill Belichick is the worst offensive coach in NFL history. Think about it. He retired Cam Newton. Superman. He was the kryptonite. He broke Mac Jones. After he went to the Pro Bowl as a rookie. He was bad with Drew Bledsoe. Who had a literal cannon strapped to his right arm. And was a first overall pick. And went to a Super Bowl. He retired the best Browns quarterback. In their franchise history. Since Otto Mother Effin Graham. What further evidence do you need just because he did well with Matt Castle with average stats with the greatest receiving core and offense we've ever seen in the 07 Patriots with Wes Welker and Randy Moss? Just because he was mid as you know what? Didn't even make the playoffs that year, bro. This guy's the worst offensive coach of all time. This is the last four weeks. These stats aren't even real, bro. These stats don't even make sense. The Patriots defense, which Belichick is a defensive mastermind. He's the greatest defensive coach of all time. I've said that numerous times. The fewest points allowed in the NFL since week nine. New England has 46 points allowed. That's the least in the NFL. The only team close is the Niners at 49. New England is 0-4 in these games. The rest of the league 4-0, 3-1, 3-1, 4-0. Those teams are the Niners, Dolphins, Ravens, and Colts. 
The 2017 Browns went 0-16. They averaged 14.6 points per game. The New England Patriots averaged 12.3 points per game. This is the worst offense I've ever fucking seen. Their entire offense is bubble screens and halfback dive. I mean, are you kidding me? If Stevenson doesn't break eight tackles or our quarterback makes a fluky-ass throw, or Demario Douglas beats three people, or Devontae Parker makes one of his crazy, uh, falls backwards, catches a ball over three people out of bounds catches, we don't, move the bo- we don't move the ball. Our tight ends, slow and overrated. Our receivers can't separate to save their lives. If you had to ask Devontae Parker and Juju to separate from a normal human, with their life on the line, I highly doubt they could get it done. Mike Giardi tweeted, all other teams in 2023 are 53-0 when allowing 10 points or fewer. The Patriots are the first team to lose three straight games despite allowing 10 or fewer points since the Chicago Cardinals in 1938. Are these stats even real? Do you think I'm lying? This man, Belichick, stinks. How are people not blaming this guy? I understand he has Bailey Zappi, who's not an NFL third-string quarterback. I get it. I get it. I understand it. And I understand people are going to look at the defense and say, wow, look at what he's doing with the defense. Bro, we can't even score a fucking point. What does defense matter? We can't score a fucking point against Brandon Staley. Guys, Brandon Staley's the worst coach in the NFL. Brandon Staley is a disaster of a coach. A disaster of how to run a defense. He doesn't know what he's doing. That's the second worst defense in the NFL. The Patriots scored zero points. I don't care if it was a monsoon. I don't care if we were playing in the ocean. We scored zero points against Brandon Staley. Like, you have to wonder, is this guy doing it on purpose? Again, we could have the best defense of all time. We can't score a point. And for people to sit here and say, it's the offensive line, it's the receivers, it's the quarterback. What about the fucking coach? Like, we just watched Jake Browning score 31 point 34? I don't even know. We just saw... C.J. Beathard, for the first time since Kyle Shanahan, come off the bench and roll up and score late in the fourth quarter against the Bengals. Bro, we're watching backup quarterbacks, and not all of them have been good. But they're scoring more than zero points. And I get it. The Patriots have quite possibly the worst receiving core in the NFL, especially the one that played on Sunday. Tyquan Thornton couldn't catch a cold. Okay? He is ass. Like, Tyquan Thornton is fucking ass. Cheeks. Like, the stats are so bad, it's impressive. I will be irate. I have love for Belichick. He will go on to another team and probably be successful because he'll get a quarterback. And it won't be bad because he'll have a good defense because he's a good defensive coach and the quarterback will carry the offense. How are you going to let this guy run the offense of our future quarterback? He already broke Mac Jones. He retired Superman. The only man that could make this guy worth a damn on offense is Tom Brady, who's the greatest player ever. Like, let's really look in a mirror. Let's really examine this. Zero points against the Chargers. Three points against the Colts. Didn't the Titans just score 27 against the Colts? Huh? The Titans? Are you telling me the Titans are that much better on offense than the Patriots? That's not true. From a uh, performance, like, player-based standpoint, they have a worse offensive line. They have worse tight ends. 
they have a rookie quarterback. They had Derrick Henry got hurt. So let's think about it. So sure, the quarterbacks stink. Sure, the offensive line isn't great. Sure, the receivers aren't great. But who's in charge of getting those players on the team? And who's in charge of coaching those players? That's it. Your week 13 review. Best in the world. Peace.